So my talk today is going to be about manufactured treescapes. Um, two soil talks in one day sounded like it could be a little bit much. So myself and Peter tic-tacked before the start of the event to make sure that we weren't going to be saying the same thing. There is a little bit of overlap between what Peter talked about this morning and what I'm going to talk about, but hopefully that will just help to reinforce some of the messages that we're both trying to make. So when I talk about manufacturing treescapes, we're talking about more and more I guess we're working in artificial, uh, uh, man-made uh, environments where, uh, particularly with urban design projects and that type of thing, we're looking at changing the soil completely uh, from what was originally there or needing to heavily uh, amend or change uh, what we start off with. So it's very much in that uh, frame of mind. So Peter very much talked about managing trees in native soils. I'm going to be talking about uh, managing trees in heavily amended or, or, or uh, newly manufactured soils. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of Science 101 on soils. Soils is something that people will always say, uh, you know, is this kind of black box, you know, that's really difficult to understand. And, and I don't want to assume any levels of knowledge here. There's some people here, I'm sure, that are very skilled in soil, uh, in soil management. Uh, and some people maybe for, for whom uh, soil really does remain a black box. So we'll try and lift the lid a little bit on soil. And I wanted to just talk about some fundamental principles, which we have talked about this morning already, uh, particularly out in the field, but uh, I think is worth reinforcing. So the first question is, what makes soil soil? You know, there's so many different types of soil. So as far as we're concerned, it's a physical medium to hold plants up for air and water movement and to hold on to water and nutrients. It's a chemical medium for nutrient holding and exchange. And importantly, it's a biological medium. And this is something that I think we in the soil science community have ignored for a really a long time. We've, we've focused very heavily on the physical and chemical aspects of soil, but we've ignored the biological aspects. And we're beginning to learn a lot more now about the importance of biological function in soil and certainly the role that the plants play, that the trees play as part of that biological system. You know, the tree is a big lump of biology that's stuck in the ground. It's communicating with the soil in some very, very sophisticated ways that we're really only beginning to discover now. But certainly it's important for organic matter cycling, pest and disease control, maintenance of the chemical and physical condition of the soil, and nutrient mineralization and supply. Now, you may have seen this uh, diagram or a version of this diagram before, but I guess I, I'm, I'm showing it again to highlight this, these kind of the, the, the three-legged stool concept of soil management, that there's three components of soil management, biologi biological, physical, and chemical. And they're all interlinked. It's difficult to talk about them in isolation. And the, the glue, if you like, and uh, 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 it's not just a, uh, um, uh, a metaphor, it truly is a glue to help hold soil together, is the organic matter in the middle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So I talk a lot about soil constraints because uh, just about all soils have got some kind of constraint. You know, there's um, very few soils that I've come across that, uh, that don't have some kind of constraint to a particular land use. And it's particularly the case in Australia, both with our native soils because of how highly weathered they are, and also in our urban landscapes where we come in and because we've changed everything around so much and our soils are you know, half soil, half building rubble, half whatever other rubbish people put into it, um, that there's going to be some kind of constraint to what use you're trying to put the soil to. And if we talk about soils in the context of the physical, the chemical, and the biological properties of soil, and the organic matter which, is a, which strongly influences those properties, I think it's a useful idea. So in terms of physical, when we're talking about physical, we're really always talking about structure. And when we're talking about structure, we're talking about the ability of that soil to allow air in and out of the soil. So I sometimes think that, um, uh, you know, I sometimes wonder how, how different we are from, from, from the trees that we're talking about. And although sometimes you might think we're not that different, actually it's true, we're not that different, in that we all need air in a very immediate kind of way. So in other words, we, we would die quickest without air. 
will die next quickest without water and will die next quickest without food. And it's pretty much the same story with trees as well. So when we're talking about structure, we're talking about making sure that, you know, that, that the air is coming, that the soil is breathing. The air is able to move through the soil at a rate that roots can utilize that oxygen for cellular respiration. Uh, we want that soil to be open enough to allow moisture to move uh, through that soil quickly enough for roots to take it up or to drain away so that the roots don't become suffocated. And of course, we want uh, the uh, roots to have the ability to find uh, food in that area as well. And compaction, you know, I maintain that um, the vast majority of our soils are compacted, so much so that we, we assume, uh, that, that we kind of take it for granted. Oh, now let me rephrase that. I think so, uh, compaction is so common that we don't realize that our soils are compacted. We think it's kind of normal for our soils to be hard. So even when we were doing the planting demonstration, wherever I should be pointing that direction, um, whoever the gentleman was on the spade when we were, when we, uh, must have been uh, Ronan, you know, he was pushing the front of the spade into the soil as he was speaking, and it was barely denting the soil, you know. So even there, in an area that's probably only traffic by foot, that soil is really very, very hard. And even though we saw it had good moisture content in it, I would say that soil is compacted. And if we got a penetrometer, we'd probably find that uh, roots are going to have difficulty growing through there. And in fact, we saw, you know, the, the dingo did have to, the bobcat did have to work fairly hard, even with the, with the uh, chain digger on it to, to open up that soil. The next uh, constraint that we need to think about is, is the chemical constraints. And when we talk about chemistry, that's a whole baffling world in itself. But from our point of view, it's probably best to think about the chemistry of the soil simply in terms of how easy it is for plants to access the food that they need. So with different pHs, that's going to inter, uh, uh, it will um, influence the uh, availability of certain nutrients. So really we want plants, we want the soil to be in this kind of ideal range, around about um, uh, pH in the, in the mid sixes. You know, it's no surprise that um, we have, uh, uh, our body tissues are, I think our pH is about 7.2 or something like that. And we'll find that amongst all of us here, we've got a very minor difference across all of the people in this room. Our pH is gonna be pretty standard. And similarly with uh, most biological life, there's fixed levels of pH that, that uh, the systems work best at. And so it is with soils too. But because of the age of our soils, many of, of, of our soils for various reasons, the pH has drifted way into the alkaline range or way into the alkaline range. And soils, soil, there's a relationship between the chemistry and the, and the physics of the soil because these things here, these elements which are called the cations, Cations because they have pluses after them. So hydrogen, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and aluminium are the principal ones. They have a really strong influence on pH, but they also have a really strong influence on how well soil is structured because they, in effect, form chemical bridges in the soil that help to hold the soil open. You've possibly seen this on soil test or, or heard of this concept of cation ratios, and there's a lot of kind of controversy about it, but in very simple terms, we really want our soils to be dominated by this one here, calcium. And the next highest proportion, we want to see magnesium in there. So when you get a soil test, and it, sometimes you'll see the information presented with a, a pie chart or sometimes just plain numbers, it's not so much the numbers that we kind of have to uh, think about, but rather we want to see our soils generally dominated by calcium and we want to see magnesium coming in in second place. The main reason for this is because, as I mentioned, these elements are helping to hold up the soil. So anyone who's dug a hole knows that soil is heavy. So when you put soil back in a hole, like after we planted the trees today, what is it to stop that soil you know, completely collapsing down on itself and filling all the little voids that we saw created by the different size of aggregates. Well, the thing that stops it collapsing down completely are these elements here, calcium and magnesium particularly, and organic matter. These are the things, they in effect form tiny bridges in the soil which hold the weight of the soil up. 
in other words, which allow the soil to maintain pore spaces into which plant roots can grow, in which soil organisms live, and uh, through which air and water moves. So these are the highways, if you like, in the soil. So these numbers are pretty important. And part of the reason why we always make the distinction between managing topsoil separately to subsoil is because the chemistry, particularly in this uh, part of Melbourne, the chemistry of the soil changes when you go down into the subsoil. And we'll often see magnesium coming right up. We may see sodium coming right up and calcium going down. Now, when that happens, that's when you get much kind of heavier, sloppier kind of soils. You know, if you walk across a wet paddock and you come out three inches taller on the other side because all the mud is stuck to your boots, chances are that's a pretty high magnesium soil. So this is where it affects the, the chemistry of the soil influences the physics of the soil. And uh, we talked a little bit about biology. You know, what we're trying to do, but it's very difficult to manage the biology in the soil, mainly because most of the time we don't actually know what we're managing. There's some terrific work being done at the moment trying to understand what it is in soil and how important they are and the role that they play and everything else. But it's still, um, it's still uh, you know, we, we probably understand, you know, 1% of what's going on there. But what we do know we need is diversity. Where we have diversity in any kind of ecosystem, and the soil is an ecosystem no less than any others, and you've probably heard the example, you know, there's more living organisms in a teaspoon of fertile soil than the number of humans that has ever lived on planet Earth. So there, the soil really is teeming with life. But biology, uh, diversity is what's really critical because uh, in a diverse ecosystem, you have checks and balances on organisms in the soil. And like us humans, you know, we all get sick if our internal uh, ecosystem gets out of balance. So for example, we all have streptococcus uh, in our throats now as we speak, but we're all pretty healthy. But that streptococcus that's in our throat has the ability to make us all very, very sick if it gets out of control and, uh, and uh, proliferates. So biology is also incredibly important to just about all nutrient transformations in soil. So, you know, when we put a fertilizer on the soil, the plant is not going to chew up a little granule of whatever it is we've put on the soil. That granule has to be transformed, and it's transformed by biological uh, um, action on that, uh, on that pellet to convert the nutrients in there into plant-available forms. The story of organic matter is really incredibly important. I mean, it's the food that drives the whole system. You know, organic matter is like cash in our society. You know, cash is, and cash moving is what keeps our society going. Well, organic matter is what keeps the soil going. And in fact, the only soils that really have effectively no organic matter are desert soils, and, and that's why they're fairly dead. Um, and like I said before, like us, soil life requires air, shelter, water, food, absence of toxic substances, and, and a level of evenness in the local environment. So, you know, when we planted the trees outside earlier, we put mulch around. Now, the main reason that we put mulch around is really the same reason that we put clothes on. Not for reasons of modesty or anything like that, but if we, went, if we had no clothes on and we're not adapted to that environment, well, very quickly our skin is going to suffer enormously from the sun and from drying and all of that kind of thing. And we will eventually get sick and, and die and you know, rates of skin cancer would obviously be extremely high. The same applies to the soil. It's not okay to bear the soil. The soil absolutely has to be covered. When we do um, soil testing and we look at say, you know, where the organic matter is in the soil, the closer you get to the surface, the higher proportion of organic matter you'll find and the higher the proportion of uh, uh, soil biological activity you'll find because that's the area of highest um, aeration in the soil where there's most access to uh, water when the, when, it, when the rain falls and, uh, and plenty of food because there's organic material coming in from the surface all the time. So protecting the surface of the soil is really protecting the part of the soil that is most active and when we bear that we're killing off the part that is most active and most productive in the soil. So obviously any kind of heavy intervention like plowing, waterlogging, leaving soils fallow, in other words, leaving them bare, you know, spraying with uh, herbicides and the like, compaction, dredging, these are all major disturbances to the soil ecosystem.
Now, just uh, I wanted to, you remember that uh, diagram that I showed you where all of the components are connected through the medium of organic matter. So why is biology and, uh, and organic matter important? Now, I use the, um, the analogy of a sponge because I think it, um, it uh, illustrates the importance of structure and how soils are structured. Because in soils, we've got what we call macropores, so basically these big holes here. So maybe a worm has crawled through there or a worm is hibernating in there. But also, you know that if you've got a magnifying glass or something like that, and you looked at, say, a little part of the sponge that looks relatively dense, actually you would see there are just a, a, con a continuous uh, matrix. There's a continuous matrix of, of smaller and smaller and smaller pores. Well, exactly the way the same thing applies in the soil. And of course, you know what happens when you um, are, are using the sponge and you want to wring it out and you squeeze it? Well, you absolutely collapse all of those pores. The sponge bounces back an awful lot quicker than the soil does. And this is just another little diagram that I sometimes use, again talking about structure. And you'll recall I talked about the importance of <coughs> calcium and magnesium and organic matter to structure. These, in effect, are the, the large uh, bearers in a structure that take the most weight. So if you had a structure like this, where you have the biggest gaps, that's where you're going to have something like organic matter or calcium or magnesium, which is taking the weight of the soil and maintaining the integrity of the pore spaces. And on top of all of that, you have the biological interaction, where we have fungal hyphae, we have uh, bacterial exudates, which are kind of glues and everything else. And this is helping to stick the whole thing together. And we need to have aggregate stability. So an aggregate is a small little particle of soil. We don't want that to fall apart when it rains or when we water. We want that to maintain its shape and we want it to maintain its structure. Biological uh, coverings uh, is almost like a mesh that, uh, that helps to maintain the integrity of those structures. And uh, there was some, uh, an American soil scientist called Bradfield back in the 1950s said aggregation is flocculation. So flocculation is what we're getting here and plus cementation. And he called this biological uh, action cementation. So let's move on from there. Uh, this is a question that, I, uh, that I've used um, when I've interviewed people for jobs in the past, soils related jobs. I've said to them, why do we use polymix instead of soil in containers? And it's an interesting question, and it, does, it has, in the past anyway, separated out the sheep from the goats for me. Because, of course, it's really it's all about these things. It's all about access to water, nutrients, and air. And I'm sure we've all experienced uh, what it's like trying to grow a plant in a pot full of mineral soil, and we see how it collapses and how the soil isn't able to maintain its structure in a small, inv a small container like that. And so the plants generally suffer. The only kind of things that will survive it is maybe a a cacti or two if it's a sandy soil. So I wanted to take that information as by way of a kind of overview and say let's use that information when we approach the challenge of manufacturing treescapes. So if we are looking at um, putting in a line of trees say in, a, in an urban area where we might be dealing with native soil, but actually in that area that we want to plant the trees, we know we've got uh, stormwater uh, drains, we've got uh, concrete structures like footpaths, curb and gutterings, we've got uh, maybe other services under the footpath as well. Actually all that reduces the amount of available soil that we have to work with. So when we're approaching this, well the questions are where do we start, what materials do I use, how do I know if what I'm actually starting off with is any good or should I you know, ideally chuck it out or how do I change it, how do I improve it if I need to, you know, will the plant survive and how can I apply these principles that I've learned about physics, chemistry and biology. So the approach is really to, to start off, I think, looking for problems. As I said, every soil has got some kind of constraint, so you'll be pretty much guaranteed that there's going to be constraints uh, to what you want to do, whatever it is you want to do. Some of the constraints might be uh, significant. They might be real showstoppers unless you can do something about it, or they may be relatively minor and you possibly don't need to, uh, to worry about it uh, um, in the short term. So we want to know what condition the soil is in to at least uh, 500 millimetres. Um, we'll talk a little bit more as we go through about why that's important. 
we want to assess the structure and texture of the soil and note changes in color as we go down the profile. So Peter talked about that a little bit this morning and particularly some of those um, profile photographs that he showed. You know, there was a remarkable difference in color and texture between the topsoil and the subsoil. You know, the one in particular had a sandy gray topsoil overlying a reddish heavy clay. You know, they're almost two completely different soils. And in fact, often geologically, they are completely different soils because in, uh, often those sandy soils have, have come in after the uh, clay, for, clay um, uh, soil has formed. We want to note the depth at which color and texture changes occur. And we want to see if there's physical limitations present. So sometimes we'll get a layer of coffee rock, for example, or laterite material, which is really hard. You know, the, 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 the roots just aren't going to get through it. So even though you might have a depth in your profile, if you have a layer of, of some kind of impenetrable layer, particularly if it's relatively close to the surface, that's what you're going to be growing in. So those plants are really going to suffer if, uh, if, uh, if uh, things uh, uh, get dry. Note impediments to drainage. So it may be such a layer, or it may be just a very dense clay subsoil. Note evidence of salinity or compaction or poor growth in surrounding vegetation is always a good indication of problems. And arrange chemical testing of the A horizon at a minimum. And I say at a minimum because if you consider, again, going cast your mind back to that uh, soil profile, we have two completely different soils. We've got a sandy textured topsoil and we've got a heavy clay subsoil. The chemistry of those two soils is frequently very, very different and will have a significant bearing on perhaps your, your plant selection and how those plants grow. So now we want to look for some solutions to the problem. So we want to determine firstly how much or if the native soil can be used in its current state. Uh, we want to determine the, the potential to ameliorate the topsoil or the subsoil, whichever is presenting the greatest constraint to what you want to do. Uh, we need to determine obviously if imported material is, is uh, required. We want to use a specification to determine what kind of soil type for topsoil or subsoil. So that's either in the case of if we're going to ameliorate what we're dealing with or if we need to bring in new material to do the job we wanted to do. And with all of these things, we want to mimic the horizon structures and soil depths when we come to reconstruct the soil profile. The, 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 there's a particular um, subsection of soil science called pedology. And uh, the pedologists are an interesting kind of breed because uh, what they're doing is they're, they're, this is the science of soil peds. And a ped, as you may remember from, from your, um, from your uh, uh, soil um, education, are basically small little aggregates of soil. So they study soil aggregates in enormous detail. And um, I challenge any pedologist to do the after lunch talk because um, it can get a little bit um, um, monotonous. Anyway, the, the, I mentioned the pedologists because they are happiest when they're in a pit. So many of you have probably visited a soil pit. They're usually constructed to about a meter, a meter and a half, uh, a meter, 1.2 in, in depth. And um, to see grown men just staring at and touching the side of the soil pit uh, is, is quite interesting. But anyway, they're, they're fascinating guys and they can tell you a huge amount of information about the soil that forms there. But some of the things that they're principally interested in are things like the texture of the soil. So again, when we talk about texture of the soil, we're saying is it a sandy soil? through which you know, water is going to run fairly easily, or are we talking about a heavy clay soil which is really going to hold up uh, so, uh, water movement? What's the color of the soil and what's the color telling us? And you know, in very general terms, you know, when we look at a very pale soil, it, tend, it will tend to be low in organic matter. If we see a soil that's very red, we know that it's got a lot of iron in it and it's um, been uh, exposed to weathering, uh, usually for a fair amount of time. And of course, the structure of the soil. How do we interpret the structure of the soil? You know, how cloddy is it? How fine textured is it? And um, I, I think that I, I really believe we all know what really good soil looks like, but we actually don't get to see it very often. And probably the, the, the main place that we get to see really good soil is in our own vegetable gardens if we 
have a vegetable garden. Because we treat the soil in our vegetable garden usually very differently to the soil everywhere else. But we would like the soil everywhere else to be the same as in our vegetable garden. Of course, that's not going to happen unless we give it the same amount of TLC. But what that does remind us of is, well, we all know what really good aggregation looks like. Fine, stable peds, good structure, loose material, full of organic matter, and generally we'll see lots of worms and everything else in it too. When we're talking about um, profiles, we want to, we're interested also in the type of boundaries between the different colors and the different layers. And the, and the, 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 the boundary gives us lots of information about soil properties, how that soil formed, how old it is, all that kind of thing. That's part of understanding profile form. This is just a schematic here of some work that uh, Cecil did in Sydney. Uh, you may have heard of this Barangaroo development, which is the kind of the biggest thing since sliced bread up in Sydney, this massive foreshore development that's costing I don't know how much money. But um, Cecil was given the challenge of reconstructing, the brief was to reconstruct Sydney sandstone vegetation in this foreshore location. So we did some research to look at what is the uh, physical and chemical profiles particularly of soils typical of the Sydney sandstone basin. And we found that uh, really they're, they're super strongly mineral soils. So they're nearly all made up of degraded uh, sandstone. So these uh, profiles were reconstructed using a simple mulch, some crushed <coughs> sandstone, washed sand, a small proportion of compost, 10 to 20% in the topsoil, and then uh, crushed sandstone uh, and washed sand in the subsoil. And this is the compacted subbase here. But, but note, no organic matter in the subsoil. And I was interested by what um, I think Peter was saying about that research that's looking at placing the um, organic matter to 500 millimeters depth. That, um, in our experience, once you get below 300 millimeters, depending on soil type, you're, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of touch and go to whether the organic matter is going to pay dividends at that depth. And it very much depends on what we've been talking about, the aeration, the drainage of the soil at, five, at uh, half a meter down. So the next step on, obviously, is you know, from uh, things like the Barangaroo development is uh, trees in confined uh, um, growing environments. So trees in pits or trees in podiums, there's calculations required to match the available volumes with the tree species selection. Now, there's various rules of thumb, which I'll, I'll cover off on in a moment. But um, as part of uh, um, our principal, Simon Leake, has recently written a book with um, uh, a landscape architect, Elke Haig. Elke, as part of her contribution to the book, did some really extensive research um, drawing information together from, from all around the world on tree volumes. And she developed a tree volume calculator, which, is part of the, which comes as part of the book to help get quite accurate uh, estimation of the tree volumes for particular tree species. So the soil specification is um, not only are we considering the, the uh, soil volume in the, with the specification, but we want to look at how we're going to maximize these elements as well. So infiltration, drainage, water holding, etc. Now, you know, we talk about trying to get uh, conditions right for native, uh, uh, in native soils for tree planting and everything else. And luckily for us, uh, you know, trees, uh, native soil is enormously forgiving. You know, most of the time, things generally work out. You know, the tree, you know, is able to put out a reasonable root system, all things uh, being equal. And uh, so generally, you know, soils are, are relatively forgiving. But when we're talking about soils in a confined area, those soils aren't going to be nearly so forgiving because the volume isn't there to compensate for the lack of, so the, the, the qual quantity isn't there to compensate for the lack of quality. So we have to make sure that the quality is really spot on when we're dealing with confined plantings. You know, small considerations about, you know, if you're going to grow a large tree and you're going to put it into a, 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 a very organic mix, we know that we'll get shrinkage in that mix over time and we'll potentially get the position of the tree moving or certainly we'll have the volume of the uh, growing medium reducing over time. Um, irrigation and drainage, we keep coming back to that. And maintenance, including biannual or annual fertilizing, must be considered. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but you have to be aware of it. So again, with um, minimum soil depths, you know, here's some 
uh, some kind of rules of th thumb for trees over particular sizes uh, when they're in confined areas and large trees. So generally, for large trees, we're looking at a minimum of, uh, of a metre uh, of soil depth. And these are the kind of considerations that we must consider down the bottom. And it's really what we've been talking about, you know, climate, moisture, water, oil capacity, etc., etc., including shared root system and expected lifespan of the tree. <coughs> Ultimately, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's about oxygen. Uh, because it doesn't matter if we get all other aspects, you know, it might be a really nutrient-rich soil, it might have lovely properties, but if, it, if we haven't got the oxygen moving in, particularly into a confined uh, root zone, that tree is not going to survive. And again, here's some useful in rule of thumb indicators for uh, the um, diameter of the trunk relating to the proposed soil volume. And I understand all of these... Um, Presentations are going to be available on the website, so you'll be able to access this information later on. It's also important to realize that topsoil depth is closely, associate, is closely associated with aeration and drainage. So shallow soils must have a high airfield porosity, and deep soils is not so important. And again, this is a little bit of a trade-off between the quantity aspect and the quality aspect. If you're dealing with a very small volume of soil, it really has to be perfect to, to uh, meet the needs of what you're trying to grow in it. But if you have greater depth to play with, then the tree is able to, to, a, to a certain extent, able to work things out for itself. And obviously with them, um, you know, uh, shallower profiles as well, there's always the risk of perched water table. And in fact, I was quite interested to observe with the figs that were planted at the front before, when the bags were opened, you know, the bottom, what, almost 50% of the root ball was, was cast aside because it was, looked like it was a, a, an anaerobic zone uh, in which roots had died because they'd been sitting in too much water at that, um, at that uh, um, so that, in effect, is a perched water table in those root bags. And whether engineering has all the answers is a, is a moot point. You know, if we have a, a, a normal loamy soil, we've got a, you know, usually we'll be able to use 100% of that soil. If it's in some kind of structure, we've got to take, allow for that. So when we talk about, say, soil depth being a meter, a minimum meter for uh, trees, Usually we won't get a metre of soil because we'll have some kind of drainage allowance down the bottom, whether it's some kind of artificial medium or gravel or whatever else, and we'll have mulch at the top of the container. So we might end up with only 850 of usable soil in there. And of course with structural soil, sorry, with structural soil, uh, the actual amount of soil in there in that volume is greatly reduced. And of course that's got serious implications for the well-being of the tree, so we have to take that into consideration too in, um, in estimating soil volumes using, if we were using structural soil. So I, I make the point that artificial soil profiles use principles of structural soil. So you'll understand that with structural soils, they're about maintaining uh, weight uh, bearing capacity uh, and at the same time allowing the free movement of air and water into that soil profile. Um, when we're uh, manufacturing soils, whether we're using sand or whether we're using gravel or whatever else, we're concentrating very much on a, on a medium that's going to remain open. And that's really the point of structural soils where we've got that kind of weight bearing function uh, with the soil in between. So just a quick word about transplanting. We've seen a few of these diagrams already. Um, when we're backfilling, we really must remember the rules of soil horizons. And uh, often site soils are unsuitable or holes are too small and, and drainage is often compromised. And I think Peter made this point before that if you were planting, you know, if the depth of your soil uh, ball uh, ends up sitting on the, on the um, uh, top of the B horizon, which happens to be a heavy clay horizon, you know, there may be drainage implications there. Similarly, in a, lo a lot of the time, and no doubt you've all been in situations where you've been planting trees in soils where the topsoil might be only two inches thick. So in effect, you're planting that soil into the subsoil. Um, what kind of uh, allowances need you make in those kind of situations to make sure that drainage is going to be adequate? And that's potentially where gypsum uh, might be an important part of, um, of the planting operation, but we can talk about that separately. 
So when we're talking about manufactured soils, we need to be able to clearly specify what it is we're looking for. So if we're saying we want to have a soil that's fit for purpose, we want to have a soil that's capable of growing what it is we want to grow in it, we have to be able to say, well, what does that mean? What does that look like when we actually write it down? So one of the first places that we start is with a fitness for purpose statement. So we want to say this soil is designed or is required to grow such and such a thing for however long, possibly with a um, you know, certain amount of water holding or nutrient holding potential. But you need to be able to articulate what it is you're looking for from the soil. Then from that, we need to detail the performance specification. So what are the physical and chemical properties required to bring about our fitness for purpose, fit for pur fitness for purpose statement? So again, these must be consistent with the intended purpose and they must be modular. So generally what we'll do is uh, recommend that we'll talk about ranges rather than, it's a bit difficult to say, you know, the soil has to have a pH of 6.5 because that could take a lot of messing around to actually achieve that. But if we say we're happy with a pH of between 6.2 and 6.8, much easier to achieve. Uh, in, in the book that I mentioned, there's a, there's a recipe section, which is, if you like, a, a series of templates from which specifications can be drawn. And of course, uh, quality assurance and quality control requirements need to be common to all specifications as well. So this is just an example of a fitness for purpose statement. So you know we're talking about a sandy loam to clay loam topsoil mix designed for this um, with particular um, uh, specified outcomes. So this is what I want to grow in it. Um, and uh, there's no particular uh, issues such as uh, phosphorus sensitivity. Um, the specification will look something like this. So we'll have a separate specification for the topsoil and a separate specification for the subsoil. We'll talk in here about certain proportions of the ingredients that we want to use in this manufactured soil. So whether it's crushed sandstone or compost or coarse sand or, or uh, whatever material that we have to work with. And again, whether the, whether the intended use is say for amenity turf or whether it's for large park trees, the specification is going to differ in line with the different requirements of those plants for optimal growth. So what would we do? We, uh, we want to know what's going into it. So if we are using crushed sandstone or we're using uh, blue metal or we're using some kind of recycled soil, we want to know what its characteristics are. We'll make a trial based on best estimates of performance and then we'll check that trial. We'll do an analysis of that. We'll look particularly at uh, its uh, hydraulic uh, conductivity, uh, how well it's able to hold water, how much air is in that mix, and what kind of, uh, what its cannon exchange capacity is, how much nutrient is it going to hold. That will be refined until we get a final revision of the mix and publish a product representation. And this is basically the process that we ran through for Barangaroo and other large developments. So in terms of what you should do, um, you, you really need to know what you're dealing with. You know, and this is, uh, I'm talking to soil yards around, uh, around Melbourne and, um, and I say to them, what's in your soil? You, most of them can't even give me a specification for what they're selling. They, they, they actually don't know what they're selling and I find that really extraordinary. And certainly if a landscape architect rings up and says, I've got a specification here, can you fill this? Well, they need to be able to understand the specification in the first instance and then make sure that they're able to produce a product that meets that specification, otherwise no sale. Um, any kind of representations that we get, we, we, want, we want them to be in writing. So, you know, this is our native mix. You know, how often do you hear that? Like they'll sell a native mix, a sandy mix, or a general mix. And we've analyzed some of these mixes and found <laughs> they're the same mix. Um, so don't always buy the cheapest. You know, they all say buy cheap, buy twice, or at least expect further costs down the track. And we know that if our, if our plantings fail for some reason or other, uh, often it's because we haven't, you know, due diligence hasn't been followed. And uh, this is often an interesting, ask to see their plant growth trials or recent jobs. So good specifications are there to help protect the client, the designer and the contractor because when things go wrong, the client will blame, you know, become the blame game. And I'm sure you've all been caught up in that at some stage. Now, I just wanted to, to uh, cover off uh, on another small aspect of work that, um, that I, I guess we see a lot of and that's uh, troubleshooting. So, 
What I've talked about previously is about trying to set things up so that things go right from the get-go. But often that doesn't happen and people you know, run ahead or problems emerge after a period of time and we get called in to say, okay, what's going on here? So often uh, it, it can be an issue around fertilizing, but not unless the tree is too big, uh, the tree is in structural soil, nutrient removal is significant, tree is diseased, or the tree is in a fixed sized container. This is, uh, there's been some interesting discussion around this idea recently of trees needing fertilizer and you, you'll all be aware of, of, of uh, the, the problems of elm trees in, um, in, uh, in Melbourne and we can say oh, it's because this pesky beetle has come in and is eating the trees but to what extent are the trees able to defend themselves and trees have got fantastic immune and, and, uh, and uh, uh, defense mechanisms just like we do. They've got a whole um, a class of compound that is mobilized when the plant is attacked. Um, but for the plant to be able to mobilize those defenses, it needs to be in, in very good condition, the exact same way as with us. If we are going to fight an infection or a disease, the better condition we're in, the better we're going to be able to fight it. But if we're in a weakened condition, the disease will get the upper hand. That's something that obviously needs a bit more investigation, but it's uh, certainly well worth looking at. So when we try and diagnose tree problems, we, you know, I think it's, it's true to say that tree dis-ease, and I'm not talking about disease, but just kind of the general kind of in, ill health thing, is, I don't know if I'm overstepping it by saying mostly due to below ground conditions, but I'd certainly say in the majority of cases due to below ground conditions. We know that roots struggle in urban environments. We know that stressed roots means a stressed tree. Uh, I've just mentioned briefly the role of nutrition in plant health and the role of nutrition in plants' immune systems. And again, you know, is air, water, food, or habitat being constrained by what is uh, going on in the soil? This is an example of a job we had to do up in Hyde Park in Sydney where there was uh, a row of Chinese elms were getting really sick and defoliating and looking uh, altogether unhealthy. Um, when we did the analysis of the tissue, we found that uh, with the principal macronutrients of N, P, and K, they were all well below range where they should be. Um, the uh, treatment here was simple fertilizing. So, you know, there was no problem with rooting depth, soil depth, drainage, etc. The only problem in this particular instance was nutrients. Another job that we did was um, at uh, resort gardens where there was three separate uh, container grown uh, uh, collection. So these were very large containers growing a number of these trees. And when we investigated here, note the moisture content, particularly in our tropical garden. Now we know that our tropical plants generally are used to and enjoy a fair amount of water. These plants were absolutely drying out. And when we looked a little bit further at the nutrient status of the plants, you know, we have here potassium really standing out as being uh, you know, uh, a really strongly limiting element uh, in this situation. So again, we need to take a very broad view of what's going on in, in, in a particular situation. And in this case, you know, the, the problem really was quite easily solved. They thought that the plants were getting lots of water because when they pulled the mulch apart, the top of the uh, soil was, was damp. But the problem was they had you know, about six to nine inches of mulch sitting over the top of this bed. So whenever they irrigated, the mulch sucked up most of the water and then evaporated it off very readily. The soil was dry down below about 30 millimeters, uh, centimeters. In this in instance, improper irrigation, poor monitoring of the nutritional status of the soil, calculation of water deficit, we did this an application of potassium and ammonium, so, and this was part of the, the remediation work that was done. So this is the book that, um, that I mentioned. This uh, is published by CSIRO, as a, and, and CSIRO were happy to publish it because they saw it as a valuable contribution to soil management. The reason I think it's a valuable contribution to soil management is because there's really, you know, the, the literature on soil management in the urban environment is really uh, very low. Most of the work on soil, as you'll appreciate, has been done in the, in the productive environment, looking at uh, food producing soils. Um, this has got uh, uh, 13 specifications which are designed to be cut out and pasted into contract documentation. So I think increasingly you're going to see 
greater quality control, quality assurance coming through soil production and what the work you're asked to do, and hopefully that's going to make your work a lot easier as well, and, and confidence that the work that you do is going to um, have the longevity that you, uh, that you expect from it. And uh, finally, uh, I make the point that soil is a science and not an art. Um, people can have green thumbs, and from that point of view it's an art, but actually getting soil right is really a, a scientific undertaking that we have to, uh, that we have to approach with uh, the utmost rigor. So thank you for your attention.